Good evening, and thank you once again for visiting us here at the beautiful state-of-the-art El Barrio Firehouse Community Media Center for the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vredos. I'm a sociologist and criminologist at John Jay College here in New York City, and we're with you every Sunday evening at 8 p.m. on MNN, your Manhattan Neighborhood Network. The show is repeated on Thursday evening at 8 p.m., on MNN4. We are a show that tries to explore the possibilities, the ideas, the vision that can help bring about a more progressive and humane world. We're committed to the view that a radical imagination is necessary to help break us out of long tolerated patterns in a world that is increasingly destructive and dysfunctional for more and more of humanity. The old paradigms and ideas have largely proven to be failures and have led to endless wars, unbearable poverty for most of the world's population, and a crushing of the human spirit and Mother Earth. This show imagines the possibilities of that more humane world and the need to work toward it with new transformative ideas, strategies, and action. A radical imagination is often nourished in a younger generation by those ideas and courageous individuals who've been active and bore witness to earlier historical moments of struggle and pain. We have two of these individuals here tonight on the show, iconic progressive figures who have spent their entire lives continuing the tradition to the present day. Gerald Lefcourt is considered one of the nation's best trial lawyers and a leading spokesman of the defense bar. He is past president of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, the New York Criminal Bar Association, the New York State Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and president for the Foundation for Criminal Justice. He has taken on unpopular and high-profile clients such as the Black Panthers, Abby Hoffman, Harry Helmsley, co-defendant of Michael Milken, former New York State Assembly Speaker Mel Miller, Russell Crowe, and Tracy Morgan, just to name a few. He'll be forever known, along with William Kunstler, as the radical lawyers of their generation and for all those who consider themselves forever young. James Gilligan is an American psychiatrist and author best known for his series of books entitled Violence, where he draws on 25 years of work in the American prison system to describe the motivation and causes behind violent behavior. His recent book, Why Some Politicians Are More Dangerous to Your Health Than Others, is a brilliant depiction of how a transformation of the American political and economic system with policies emphasizing respect nurturing and education can lead to a lowering of our levels of violence, which are the highest in the developed world. Gilligan has been president of the International Association for Forensic Psychotherapy, director of the Harvard Institute of Law and Psychiatry. He was brought in as the medical director of the Massachusetts Prison Mental Hospital in Bridgewater, Massachusetts, because of the high suicide and murder rates within their prisons. When he left, 10 years later, the rates of both had dropped to nearly zero. 
He recently has been involved as lead author of the Rikers Island Report, documenting the violence and brutality there. He has called for its shutting down and creation of humane therapeutic communities that restrain rather than punish and shame. Welcome, Jerry and Jim. It's great to have you here. Nice to be here. Thank you. Terrific. So <clears throat> both of you bore witness to the radicalism of the 60s in your individual ways. Um, we need another period like that, don't we? What was happening, Jerry, uh, during that period that you can relate to our audience here and give, an, uh, give us an idea of the energy and, and youth that well, you, uh, know, you were involved in? It was in. an incredible time where mm. the convergence of feelings about the Vietnam War, feelings about racism, uh, poverty, civil rights, all came together at a particular moment in time. I would say probably the early 60s through the mid 70s, a period of, to me, <laughs> the greatest generation. Because mm -hmm. uh, I remember one of my clients, Abby Hoffman, was asked way back in 1989, after all of this was over, uh, what did it all mean? What did that period really mean? Mm -hmm. And without missing a beat, he said, well, we didn't end uh, racism, we ended Jim Crow. We also ended the notion you could send uh, 100,000 troops 10,000 miles away without the people's consent. And even the president has to talk about child care nowadays. And so he said we were young, we were crazy, silly, but we were right. And that, that whole time made changes that obviously uh, we have benefited from for many years with the women's movement, civil rights movement, a black president, and the like. Exactly, but, well, we'll get back to that. Whether Jim Crow has been finally uh, destroyed is, is a question, and we could well, and no certainly question, we'll talk about that there as we go on. Yeah, <laughs> the new Jim Crow, yeah. uh, Michelle Alexander's great book. And, and Jim, what were you doing at this time? I was uh, mm. in medical school, but I've always been politically active, so I... Uh, went to Washington several times to lobby our congressmen and senators against the Vietnam War and against the patterns of racial segregation and discrimination that we still suffered from. Um, and uh, th there's no question there was more activism then mm. uh, than, there, than there has been recently. And that certainly has puzzled and disturbed many of us. Why aren't... Um, uh, young people and middle-aged and elderly people rising up, you know, unanimously uh, to protest against uh, the uh, outrages that continue to happen in America. We talk about overthrowing Jim Crow, and you're absolutely right. There's the new Jim Crow, which we now call mass incarceration, which has been a, a way to reinstitute white supremacy by putting a disproportionate number of African-American men in prisons, disenfranchising them so they can no longer vote, rendering them essentially un, uh, unable to get a job when they leave prison, uh, brutalizing them while they're in prison, and then acting surprised when they show the results of some of that, sometimes when they, when they leave. Um, we have so much to protest against in this country at this point that is unconscionable and inexcusable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have... I would love to see the same degree of passion about politics uh, in, in the world of America today that we saw in the 60s, 50 years ago. The moral outrage, the righteous indignation yeah. uh, that you felt also and took up the cause in the courtroom, right? Yeah. So that you was know, a lightning rod there, to right? To me, was, I've always been uh, very affected by racial issues. Um, Why? I was, just, I was just, very young. Hmm. I, I lived uh, in Jersey City, New Jersey, and I went to a predominantly black school. I think there were three whites in my class, and my best friends <laughs> were obviously blacks. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, just a growing up under an understanding 
of problems in the black community. And when I went through law school, um, I threw an honors program. I got to work at the Legal Aid Society mm -hmm. and saw mm -hmm. blacks and Latins uh, on incredible numbers thrown in cells with one public defender responsible for all of them. And when I worked for this particular person, he would say, go into the pens and prepare the next arraignment. I said, I'm a law student. Yeah. I don't know what well, I'm that's good doing. enough, right? I, mean, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Hmm. It was so frightening to me yeah, that to it was my goal hmm. to join the Legal Aid Society as a public defender and start a union uh, of legal aid lawyers. And we accomplished that, but first they had to fire me for organizing these meetings. Uh, but it was formed and it radically changed, really. You can't imagine what it is today from what it was. We had no books, no investigators, no training, uh, no help. Uh, it was frightening. We were a mm. disgrace. And today, at least, the lawyers have a chance. So that got me started when I was fired. I got involved with uh, uh, civil wait, rights wait, wait, You were fired for what? For uh, organizing the union. For organizing, right, OK. This was so a terrible was thing. So I lost my first job. Okay. And uh, I, it's my sister-in-law, Carol Lefcourt, was volunteering. She was also a lawyer for a black woman <coughs> lawyer by the name of Florence Kennedy. Flo <coughs> Kennedy, yep. sure. And yeah. Flo Kennedy yeah. said to me, you're going to mm. be a great lawyer. And I said, I just lost my first job. She said, you don't understand. You're refusing to consent to oppression. <laughs> and I want to introduce you to Bill Kunstler, she said. Uh -huh. The rest is pretty much history. That, we did civil rights cases, Black Panther cases, the Chicago 8, uh, the students at Columbia, the students at CCMY. I mean, just massive numbers of cases. I was in an, a unique position for a few years where I represented SDS, the Black Panthers, the Yippies, and introduced them to each other. It was <laughs> <laughs> so strange. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. Wow. Yeah. And you as a young man were working, you were working in mental hospital, right? And your fellow uh, psychiatrist thought that was sort of a dead end uh, place for psychiatrists to be working? Or in how did, fact, I... And you took it seriously, I thought right? I, I thought it was going to be a dead end. I mm. only started... Uh, working in something I'd never heard of before called prison psychiatry hmm. because I needed to supplement my salary. I was still in training and I had a wife and three children and I couldn't afford to support the family. So I learned I could make some extra money by moonlighting as a prison psychiatrist. I thought it was going to be a waste of time. That I, I had been taught up to that point that people in prison were untreatable and so forth. And I quickly discovered that Virtually everything I had been taught up to that point was wrong, or was at least a, a half-truth with the most important half left out. And I found it was the most uh, emotionally moving experience I'd had in psychiatry, because I was face-to-face -face with the deepest human tragedies on a daily basis. And I mean not just the tragedies that these men had exposed their victims to, but the tragedies they themselves were the survivors of. Um, in other words, mostly my clients. <laughs> mostly your clients, yes. Exactly. You would treat exactly. them in court and defend them there. I was dealing with them in, in the prison. The level of child abuse that this population had suffered was off the scale of anything I had ever mm. imagined existed in this country. The uh, most violent among the people I saw were the survivors of their own attempted murder, often at the hands of their parents, or the actual murders of their closest relatives often in front of their eyes. Um, I, I learned that uh, these people were, however, not uh, resistant to therapy. They were eager to have somebody they could talk with and try to make sense of their lives and try to reform their lives. Uh, I, so I quickly got converted. And I've, uh, as I said, I spent 25 years trying to break out of prison because <laughs> this was very painful and, and draining and exhausting work. But it was so important socially and so fascinating intellectually and, and uh, so moving emotionally that uh, I, I couldn't leave this. And I quickly learned 
that the prisons as they're ordinarily run do more to stimulate violence and crime than they do to prevent it or deter it, but that that can be changed if you have the kind of support you need to do that. I was able to do what I did there because the federal courts ordered the state prison system to let a team from the Harvard Medical School into the prisons mm -hmm. to provide mental health care. Mm -hmm. uh, up to that point, the prisons were like a war zone. There was a murder a month and a, sui a suicide every six weeks in one prison alone and riots throughout the system. People were getting killed right and left. Uh, and as you said, by the time we left, we had been able to bring that down. We could go 12 months at a time without a single fatality in any of the state prisons. I, I, I learned that violence is a problem that can be prevented. The question is just, do we care enough about it to put in the time and effort to do that? It's, it's, it, we, know, we know what to do. Well, prisons have I always thought to be mental hospitals more by <laughs> By and large, I mean, it's really where society throws those who are suffering from abuse and whatever. Uh, but that, yep. as a public defender and, you know, as a lawyer today who cares about indigent defense, we understand that most of that, uh, it, you know, comes from a place that should be treated totally different. Absolutely. And you've documented that in the Rikers report, right? Yes. Uh, a, a huge percentage of the inmates at Rikers Island and in state prisons throughout the country and jails throughout the country suffer from one form or another of mental illness. Uh, I've often said that in America, both the criminal justice system and the mental health system are broken. They're simply broken. And I think that's absolutely true. And in part, they're broken for the same reason, because we've closed down mental health treatment for the seriously mentally ill, and we've put mm -hmm. them in prison instead. Right. Or on the street. Or on the street, and they're, they're homeless. <laughs> yeah. Or they're dead. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the death rate is high yeah. if, you're, if you're mentally ill in this country. And uh, uh, the worst possible place for somebody who's mentally ill is a prison. I mean, the mentally ill get uh, abused, taken advantage of. Uh, and and uh, I've also learned that the most effective way to turn a nonviolent person into a violent one is to send him to one of our prisons. Uh, and the tragic thing is that a majority of the new inmates coming into our prisons are being sent there for nonviolent crimes or sometimes just m meaningless parole violations yeah. that are just yeah. technicalities. Yeah. Broken windows, yeah. um, drugs. Yeah. And we're, you know, in this country we have been bankrupting one state after another to pay for the expense of keeping the highest percentage of our population behind bars of any country in the world. I mean, we are more punitive than even the so-called police states mm -hmm. like Iran or, sure. or Russia. I've often thought, you know, we consider ourselves the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're actually the land of the imprisoned and the home of the cowardly. I mean, that's, so, that's what... You know, right now, the Foundation for Criminal Justice, of which I'm president, we've raised a lot of money and convinced the president to consider clemency for thousands of federal yeah. prisoners. Mm -hmm. And we have a project called Clemency 2014. We've organized over a thousand volunteer lawyers to do clemency right. petitions. And the criteria for those who would be eligible is you have to have been in 10 years or more it has to be a nonviolent case. Can you wow. imagine? <laughs> wow. Just to start yeah. with yeah, that yeah. Good. criteria? Yeah. <laughs> well, being very politically safe here, right? And and you're still probably well. What's her reaction are you getting from the president? The president says somewhat open to through it? their what so through White House counsel, right? That he is seriously going to do a lot of these clemency petitions. He's going to grant them, and, and we're going to see every quarter. Mm -hmm. Okay. More and more until he's gone. But I think that by the time we're finished, we're looking at at least maybe a thousand or two thousand. At most, uh, until he leaves office, yeah. right? And, well, and that's what would be amazing. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, but how many are left then? Yes. We're well, talking hundreds. Two, two million. Two million. Well, you see, yeah. he's only, of course, federal. 
well, the yeah, states yeah, are yeah, where yeah. the real problem is, the place That's right. <laughs> where Jim has been. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are just so many more in the state system than the federal system. Mm. So your natural allies here uh, on this, <laughs> yes, obviously, absolutely. obviously. Um, how much were you influenced by Thomas Zaz, the deinstitutionalization movement, uh, Jerome Miller, who's also from Massachusetts, right? His attempts to develop alternatives to incarceration for juveniles. Well, these are two very different people. Yes. Uh, the one that I knew and worked, well, I didn't work directly with him, but I knew him and we were doing our respective jobs at the same time, was Jerome Miller, a wonderful reformer who was in charge of the juvenile justice system in America, at, mm -hmm. in, Amer in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. rather, at the time I was working in the, uh, in the prison system with adults. And he succeeded in actually successfully uh, removing juveniles from the, the so-called reform schools and juvenile detention centers. This is in the mid-70s, right? Mid-70s is what we're talking about? Mid-70s, that's Mid Okay, right. yes, that's right. all right. And uh, uh, he was able to get uh, uh, individualized treatment plans for every kid in that mm. system uh, with a wide variety of different placements uh, for these kids. But the, the so-called reform schools were really schools in crime. I mean, they were... These kids were being raped, they were being put in solitary confinement, they were being beaten up. Uh, I mean, he succeeded in uh, uh, enormous uh, improvements in that. Again, it taught me, this is a system that's broken, but it can be fixed. The thing is that we need to inform people, inform the public, the voters, uh, about how broken the system is and what we need to replace it with. So it can be reformed. You're not. You're talking about, but you've called for an, a shutting down of Rikers, but substituting what? Well, I would substitute the kind of program that I spent 10 years working on in the jails of San Francisco, where we had a violence prevention experiment going, comparing a group of people in an ordinary jail with a group in our experimental jail, which was run by totally different criteria, but the inmates in were identical in terms of their criminal history, their prognosis, and so forth. Uh, what we found is that by providing intensive treatment and education with the, these violent men, they were all violent men that we worked with, um, and we had them in programs that were well-designed, highly structured, six days a week, 12 hours a day. They were immersed in learning things, in group discussions, in being exposed to victims of crime so they could see how much suffering they had caused to people. Uh, uh, we had them uh, engaged in a, a range of programs that revolutionized their own thinking. They immediately started realizing the assumptions that, that have been determining their lives and ruling their decision making that they hadn't even been aware they had. Uh, beliefs that, that only came out when we talked in detail mm -hmm. about what was going through their minds when they committed the crime that led to their being sent to prison or to jail. What happened was the level of violence within the jail dropped to zero for 12 months at a time, whereas in the control group it was still with a group of 64 people at a time, roughly 60% of them committed <laughs> wow. a, a, a violent ev event that would have been a felony if it were committed on the street. Assaults, attempted rapes, and stabbings, and so forth. Uh, but the big question was, could they maintain that after they left? We found that after they left the jail, the rate of violent reoffending was 83% lower than it was in the control group. Not quite 100% lower, but 83% lower. That is amazing. And it won a national prize from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard for what they called Innovations in American Governance. It was a pilot project, but it showed, and this is again over a 10-year period, with, you know, with a total overall of thousands of, 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 of men, uh, that again, violence can be prevented. We know how to do it. Now you'd say, well, was this so expensive? Can, can we afford it? The fact is we were able to show that this program saved the taxpayers $4 for every dollar spent on it.
because the rate of reoffending and reincarceration and relitigation and it's so amazing. forth was mm -hmm. so much lower. And nothing is more expensive than locking somebody up for a year. The, there's an 50, old saying. 50,000 a year or whatever yeah. it is. They say a year in jail would pay for a year in Yale. Yeah. And, and it would. Yeah. We would do much better to spend that money sending these guys to Yale or comparable universities than we would putting them in, in, in jails where they, they only learn to be criminal. So do we have the same legal commitment to these efforts today? Well, of course, you know, it's all about Republicans and the purse strings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's what it's we all don't. about. If right. you tell That's them right. that instead of spending $5, right. uh, spend 10 in order to get the benefits of eliminating the violence that occurs when they get back out in new crimes and new incarcerations, you know, they, they don't buy into that. I mean, it's Why not? what's being spent it, this minute. That's the bottom focus, line. That's all they can see. That's all they could see. And not just Republicans, yeah. It's a fear-based criminal yeah. justice system that we are unwilling to give other sort of alternatives a chance, proven, empirically proven to be... We are at a very strange moment much, in the criminal justice system. Tell I me, I mean, it's yeah. just never been anything like this. I mean, as somebody who has been lobbying Congress on criminal justice issues my whole life, right. and certainly as president of NACDL and now the foundation, right. is that it, it was always the case that the Republican conservatives wanted to make it worse. More, yeah. more sentences, longer sentences. More punishment. But right. this is a unique time. Because people like the Koch brothers understand that this whole craziness about jailing everybody and never providing anything, right. no indigent services of any kind for the poor, is right. a, just a recipe for disaster. And so, believe it or not, led by groups like Heritage, <laughs> and the ACLU, Cato, them. Right. ACLU, yeah. the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, right. we have now a partnership. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to undo the crazy sentences that have been going on since probably the mid-80s, when the crack was very uh, popular and was causing just devastation in communities. And so for mm -hmm. the first time, there is now a bill to reduce sentencing. 6,000 people are being released mm -hmm. on the federal level, not the... Uh, the program I was talking about yeah. for clemency, but just in the change in the sentencing guidelines. Right, right. And so there is a strange moment here where the right and the left have come together mm. with a realization that this is absurd. Now, they haven't yeah, come together. The links, that's what I was going to say. Do they? <laughs> on your issues, on mental health issues. Mm. Right. Are they linked in the heritage and so on, the Koch brothers, to what? Jim is saying here. Well, that that, that is a, 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 the next level of sophistication. Mm -hmm. it seems that we to me need that to imagine <laughs> and try to work on. Yes, because again, what certainly that's what we need to do is get them out of these places and lower the sentences. But what are you going to do with them? Yeah, that's no what we haven't that. dealt with as a society, as a culture. You know, one of the <clears> things <throat> that I mean, I'm listening to Jim and I'm fascinated because this yeah. is my whole life in criminal justice yeah. and. He sees it from the inside, more or less. But one of the things that has always been upsetting to us is the lack of training uh, of prison guards, police, uh, you know, which is, creates so many problems in our society. I mean, you know, Black Lives Matter is just the tip of the iceberg as to the problems with police and their view of the community and their interactions with the community the same way prison guards and their interactions mm -hmm. with the people that they house, mm -hmm. you know, what's the answer there? How do we get <laughs> a whole other system? I'll tell you what I am proposing. I mean, and again, I come at this from a medical background. Mm. Uh, I, I deal with violence. Uh, well, to me, violence in America, I don't think of it as a moral and legal problem. I think it is a problem in public health and preventive medicine. It, it leads to injury and death, like any other medical problem. And uh, I know that medicine has made the progress it has over the last century or century and a half, mainly because we've established a kind of institution called a teaching hospital, affiliated with a medical school, which provides treatment for the sick, training for those who treat them, and research into the causes and cures of whatever kind of pathology is, 
is causing them to suffer a life-threatening uh, illness. I'm suggesting that we demolish our existing prisons and rebuild them as locked, secure residential facilities whose purpose would be treatment and training and research for the violent people who get sent to them. And I would want to restrict this almost completely, as far as possible, just to those who've committed violent acts who are really endangering the safety of the public. Mm -hmm. There are other ways we can deal with people who abuse drugs or steal things or whatever, but it's the violent that really endangers society. Mm -hmm. And if we provided the kind of treatment that I've mentioned, for example, that we used in San Francisco, or maybe we can improve on that as we have more experience and learn more. Uh, but I, I, instead, I wouldn't call this a teaching prison because that kind of applies we're continuing the prison model. Our modern prison system was only invented at the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century. It was a well-meaning experiment in social engineering that has failed. And I think it's time for us now to acknowledge it's failed and to replace it with something else that's different from the architecture on up. The architecture of jails and prisons today would not be allowed in any zoo in America. We used to keep animals in the same kind of setting, a concrete box with bars on the window. What we found was the animals die. They die out. So zookeepers have learned they have to create zoological parks to enable mm -hmm. animals to live in the kind of environment they evolved to survive in. With people, we keep them in the same kind of concrete boxes that any zookeeper would be fired for putting animals in. And then we act surprised if they behave like animals. You know, we've treated them like that. What do we expect? So I would start with the architecture. I would create a, a different kind of setting that would be a kind of enclosed college and university and therapeutic community. Let me give you an example. In a Massachusetts, college, like a in Massachusetts yeah. we did a study one year when I was running the prison mental health program to find out what program had been most effective in preventing recidivism or reoffending after people left the prison. We found one program and only one that had been 100% effective over a 25-year period. And that was for the prisoners who got a free college education in the prison, a college degree. Not one of them was returned over a 25-year period. That's amazing. And I thought at <laughs> first, first we... First 70% recidivism rate. It's 65 to 70% over three years. prison system, yeah. Over three years right, right. In, an or, in the state prisons in our country. Mm. I thought we had missed some people, but we checked with the FBI, with national, with other states. This was a valid finding. And the fact is... Um, When I reported this in a series of public lectures I was asked to give at, at Harvard, our new governor, uh, who was a Harvard graduate, uh, got a copy of my lecture. He was a former prosecutor who had been elected to office on the campaign promise to reintroduce prisoners to the joys of busting rocks. I mean, his mm -hmm. idea was you, that no punishment is too severe, or severe enough, really. Is that the former U.S. attorney of it, Massachusetts? William Well, yeah, yes. Bill Well. Yeah. <laughs> no. And uh, he said, we've yeah. got to stop this program of giving a free college education to prison inmates. Otherwise, people mm -hmm. who are too poor to go to college are going to start committing yeah. crimes to so get, they can get sent to prison to get a, a and get a free college yeah. education. <laughs> now, he was smart enough to know this was nonsense, but he was also smart enough to know that it could win him votes. And there would be some voters who would say, yes, let's be tough on crime. Rather than asking a different question is, how can we actually protect the public and increase public safety? And that's an empirical question. That can be answered by means of research, mm -hmm. the kind of research I'm talking about. What? So I'm saying I would turn jails yeah. and prisons into schools. Those, you know, a lot of prisoners are illiterate. You'd start by teaching them to read and write. But there's no reason you can't continue all the way up to a college education. Was it also true of other kinds of skills other than a college education, such as learning electricity or carpentry? Or It certainly is true. The one thing I would say is that the... 
the, the higher the degree of education, the more effective the, 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 uh, the, the result. Uh, but there's no question, the, the more education, the better. Yeah. Uh, and um, Fascinating. It's, uh, one thing I learned is that most of the prison inmates were eager to get an education. They were only disappointed because so little was offered. So I mean, this notion that somehow this is a bunch of freeloaders who just want to sit around in prison and you know, watch television and lift weights. They want something. You know, they, they want something right, positive. Right, right. Boy, if you give that to them, uh, they jump at the chance, and then, lo and behold, they stop committing violent crimes. You know, I remember the change from the idea that prisons were to educate and reform, and there were programs in prison, and I guess along came politicians like Alphonse D'Amato, who said prisoners ought to suffer for what they've done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, that, so was the, that was the uh, attitude imposed yeah. on society. Yeah. <laughs> the political right. will that needs to be transformed. Right. Yeah. And the role of leadership yeah. in your legal community yeah, to absolutely. help bring that about. And, and some of the people you defended, the Panthers and Abby Hoffman, who tried to bring that to... He was one of the great organizers, you know, and yeah. sort of live by That's that, a little about that, that yeah. famous yeah. Yeah. notion uh, of... Uh, a small, committed group of citizens could change the world. Mm -hmm. you, you, indeed, you believe that? Indeed. indeed, nothing else ever has. Right. <laughs> Margaret yeah. Mead said I believe to, that yeah. to the core. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I saw that in, for instance, Abby, who was, you know, when he was all said and done and he was speaking on campuses and he came in to say hi, I said, what do you really want to do? He said, I would like to start a school to teach organizing because mm. it is a real skill that has to be mm. learned and there are, there are methods. And you know, let me give you an example. I don't know if people understand Woodstock. Woodstock was designed by four rock promoters to make money at a large venue in Woodstock, New York. And it was very expensive tickets. It was the summer of 69. The Chicago mm -hmm. 8 were going on trial in September. The concert was in August. It had nothing to do with politics, civil rights, anti-war, nothing. It infuriated Abby. And he went in June when he first heard about it, or in May, mm -hmm. uh, before the concert. And he went into their offices and he just yelled at them about how they didn't understand that the movement was going on trial in September in the Chicago 8 case. And it was an outrage that they were going to rip off the youth culture for, for their own pockets. And they were frightened because he was threatening to uh. shut it down and oppose <laughs> it. And they said, well, what do you want? And he says, well, we want the anti-war movement, civil rights movement invited to Woodstock. Mm. And we want you to pay for it. $10,000, which in today's dollars, I don't know how much that is. Mm. A lot of money. And he brought all those groups. And we want anti-war singers. And we want... Phil Oaks, Phil and Oaks, we want yeah, this one, right. and we yeah. want that one. And he single-handedly transformed that event. Mm. And the anti-war and civil rights people were there, and it became mm. a sort of youth culture event. And in the fall, right after the concert, he wrote a book called Woodstock Nation. Mm -hmm. mm. And when he mm. went on trial in the fall and got on the witness stand in December of 1969, the clerk said, name and address, and he said, Abby Hoffman, Woodstock Nation, and Judge Julius Hoffman said, what, what is that? Not and related, by the way. And no. he said, yeah. Woodstock Nation okay. is a state of mind, <laughs> like the Sioux Nation. <laughs> and that is the whole one person. It is really quite, and there's so many events like that. The, yeah. the exorcism of the Pentagon, you remember that? Yeah. And the, yeah. All of those yeah. were creative, organizing events that people like Abby were instrumental in thinking. And what you were saying about where are they now, you know, on the one hand, they don't need leadership because they got social media, but on the other hand, they need leadership. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and do you see that leadership? I anywhere? don't. I don't, you know. Mm. I mean, it's so fascinating when you would uh, Occupy. Thinking, yeah, Occupy possibly. and Eric Garner. 
Yeah. You know, the protests after Eric Garner, you, didn't, you couldn't identify who the leaders were, but there were massive demonstrations. The West Side Highway was shut down and mm -hmm. all of this. But on the other hand, there weren't the kind of organizers and leaders mm -hmm. that could continue yeah. that stuff. You know, and I think on some level we're missing personalities <laughs> mm -hmm. who we needed. I, I agree. I agree. Um, I know Cornell West, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago too, has been in the forefront of involved in various demonstrations involved with him and protesting the trials uh, that back in 2011 with Stop, Stop and Frisk. Uh, Try to carry that on uh, this past weekend with Rise Up October. Right. Uh, mixed results. I think to expand it out into the streets to get the sort of thousands and thousands of people involved in this that need to be involved. Well, when you think about the, seen, the um, civil rights and anti war demonstrations yeah, of the that Kings, period, Malcolm X, the way they the would Panthers. develop was you know, there was the mobilization to end the war in Vietnam. What was that? The MOBE, they called it. Mm. It was all these groups, religious, mm. Catholic Coalition. charities, mm. Abby Hoffman, you know, mm. the pacifists, the SDSers, they would all meet and figure out, let's do this date. No, not that date. What are you going to do to organize? And it was, <clears throat> you know what? It was a committed group yeah. that member organizations that made those things to bring a million people to Washington, D.C., you know, half a million people saying stop the trial in the Chicago 8 in front of the Justice Department. Those things don't happen without planning and thinking, and that's what I think we're lacking. I'll throw out a name. William Barber of Moral Mondays. I don't know if you're familiar with some of his work. We're going to have him hopefully on this show in a few weeks and so on. But, but the moral outrage you were talking about, the, the, the moral indignation that seems to be lacking that... Uh, mm -hmm. Because the counter movement to the 60s has been so forceful and so persistent, it's, it's yeah, we're smashed still people fighting. down. We're, we're still, still fighting, fighting for the hearts and minds of the 60s. And, That's right. and, and, and you've written a book uh, <laughs> attempting to transform the political system or, or, or make us more aware of the needs to have a more caring, nurturing uh, political process. So. You can tell us a yeah, little well, about that. Well, let me that. tell you, I've, I've sort of gone from my kind of clinical work with individuals in the mm. prison system to trying to look at a kind of public health approach of how to deal with how to prevent epidemics of violence uh, in society at large. What I discovered was, and this is from the government's own uh, vital health statistics, that in the United States, from 1900 to the present, rates of both suicide and homicide, which go up and down together, they parallel each other, uh, have increased when Republicans have been elected to the White House and, so have, and have decreased <laughs> when Democrats have been elected to the White House at levels that are statistically significant beyond any Why? question. The <laughs> reason uh, is I think there are three social causal mechanisms for this correlation. One is that in every single Republican administration since 1900, the rate and the duration of unemployment have increased. That's without a single exception. And in every single Democratic administration, the rate and the duration of unemployment have both plummeted, really mm -hmm. fallen down. And unemployment is, has independently of party, has been shown many times to uh, be a, a statistically valid predictor of both suicide and homicide. Uh, they're, they're correlated far beyond chance. Around the world and... Around the world as well. There are similar findings in uh, the United Kingdom, in Australia, in Germany. I mean, there are many, many replications of this elsewhere. Uh, also, when Republicans have been in power, there have been much more frequent recessions and depressions. They've been much deeper, and they've lasted longer than when the Democrats were in power. Finally, the degree of inequality of income and of wealth have been much higher under uh, Republican administrations than under Democratic. The only thing that is amazing to me 
and I think really cries out for explanation, is why do people keep electing Republicans? I mean, it doesn't make any sense in terms of the public's own self-interest in having a society that is more prosperous, more equal, less violent, and, and safer well, for Well, have everybody. you ever heard of Citizens United? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's why the Supreme Court is so important yeah. to us. Yeah. I mean, here you have a decision that says a corporation is a person. Yeah. Yeah. And has First Amendment rights and, and can course, give as much money as they want. And of course, right. we'll believe that once a corporation can get sentenced to prison. Yeah. Then we'll know a corporation <laughs> right. really is a person. Right. But somehow that's never happened. Yeah. So Bernie is on to something, right? Oh, of course. Of course. And we. we oh, he gets it. He yeah. gets yeah. it. And we need to get your book uh, to him as well on this. But Well, I'd like to give my book to all <laughs> politicians who right. could uh, yeah. understand it and. and I just want to get the message out. It's not a question of me or my book. This right. is the government's data. I, all I noticed is what it showed. I mean, I didn't create the data. The government measures death rates every year by cause. So we know the rates of homicide and suicide. suicide. And we know those more accurately than for any <laughs> other form of violence. Because with lethal violence, you have a dead body. and You can count dead bodies. There's no question that this happened. And, and it's uh, so hard to understand. You know, it, it, Republicans care about this country being healthy and strong and pretty, yet our infrastructure is just caving in. <laughs> Bridges, I mean, roads, it is such a disaster and they yeah. just won't relinquish a penny. You know, it was always funded uh, by gas tax or taxes on cigarettes or... Well, they don't need to participate. It's in that sort of um, public access, right? They have other ways Well, but, ways but it's so of, essential to the economy, which they pretend to care so much about. Right, <laughs> right. It's so essential to healthy, you know, mm. transportation of goods and services and growing businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, and you wonder what it is, that, you know, about these people that make them just opposed to doing anything. Maybe have something to do with that notion, that idea that you've been developing shame culture versus a guilt culture? Yes. The well, polarization I think, yeah. of the country? I think one reason that uh, violence rises when Republicans are in power is because my work with individuals who've been violent, and by the way, the prisoners were often as suicidal as they were homicidal. I mean, both problems are major right. problems in a prison population. The, the moment I had somebody who'd committed a murder who got sent to my mental hospital or the prisons I was in charge of, I knew I also had a suicide risk on my hands, as well as somebody who'd committed a lethal violence towards somebody else. Well, what I learned was the main cause at an emotional, psychological level, an individual level, the main cause of violence toward others or toward the self is people feeling ashamed and humiliated. And that can take a... We have, 40 synonyms for what I'm calling shame. Like we have 40 synonyms for the word flower, you know, uh, roses, daffodils. People, I would ask violent men why they had committed an assault or, on somebody or even killed them. They'd say it was because he disrespected me. And they used that term so often, they abbreviated it into the slang term, he dissed me. And I figured anytime somebody uses a word so often, they, they abbreviate it, it tells you something about how central it is in their moral and emotional vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So what unemployment does, which the Republicans bring with them, is it humiliates people. I mean, nothing is more humiliating than to be told, you are worthless. I mean, you are worth nothing. You aren't even worth your salary. We're not going to pay you a penny because you're not worth anything Minimum to us. wage issues yeah. and all this stuff. Absolutely. And every yeah. economic policy that the Republicans have been advocating are have the effect of humiliating people. I've read some, certainly not, not, not all of <laughs> what you're talking about, but I always understood from a lot of psychiatrists, forensic people that I've worked with in courts, done about 60 murder cases, uh, that violence begets violence and that so yeah. many of uh, the violent actors in the criminal justice system come from families where they yeah. experienced abuse and violence 
Uh, is that part of the shame or is that a synonym? <laughs> yes, I mean I've often asked why child abuse, even when it doesn't kill the body, you know, would kill the soul of, of the person and turn the person into a violent offender. And what I realized was when you're getting beaten up by somebody or assaulted, battered, um, or abused in any other way, you're aware that the person doing that to you doesn't love you. I mean, even a pet dog knows it's not loved if it's being kicked and beaten. And children are certainly no less perceptive than dogs. And what I learned was that the people in the prisons had experienced the ultimate deprivation of love. They would tell me something I had never read about or heard before. They would say that they themselves had died yeah. even Soul before death. they started killing anybody yeah. else. What yeah. they meant was their personality had died. Mm. They felt numb inside. They felt dead. They were incapable mm. of having any feelings, either emotions or physical sensations. They would mutilate themselves to see if they could have feelings and discover they were still numb. And I learned that that was preceded by an overwhelming humiliation, a feeling of just being treated like dirt, being treated worse than a pet dog. And uh, that's, that's the, the background of the, the most violent people in the, in the prisons. And that's why what is most needed is not more punishment. It's, it's treatment and understanding and giving the, pe the person the resources they need to regain their self-respect and their self-esteem so they can at, at least develop some pride in themselves, as, some sense of dignity yes. as a human being. Amazing work. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and so you're calling for not only this individual um, transformation as well, uh, but cultural transformation, Absolutely. political transformation Absolutely. we need to be working toward. Um, yep. And your recommendation is to? To trans, well, not just to transform the prison system. That's only right. part of this. To transform the whole political and economic system. Um, to create greater equality. I think equality is, is extremely important and central here. Because it's when people are told that they are unequal, that they're inferior, that's another synonym for shame and humiliation. You're not well, as good as other people. I understand Absolutely. and, of course, agree with your feelings about what Republicans do when they get in. But are there Democrats that talk about these issues? Because you don't hear it that much. You don't hear people talking about re reform of a prison system or uh, a culture in that way. Actually, you're right. That's amazingly missing yeah. in the public debate. That's why I keep trying to bring people's attention to this in hopes that we can get these issues onto the political radar screen. Because this is such the per perfect time to yeah. do that yeah. with all of these groups coming together yeah. over sentencing. And, crime. and that's yeah. why we've, we've got yeah. this show as well, so we oh, can great. have this yeah. uh, discussion. And I... I, I just yeah. want to make a closing statement for us here. Um, the radical imagination is interested in continuing the dialogue with the great majority of the American population who find their voices and aspirations stifled by the traditional politics as usual, business as usual debate with America's political and economic elites. There is little of any question, particularly since the economic debacle of 2008, that there has been a dramatic upsurge in general discontent and overall questioning by the general public of the various institutions of authority that hold economic, cultural, political, and moral sway over them. We experienced that in the 60s. We would like to imagine and understand the possible form that this change in mass questioning might take today and encourage efforts that would manifest it in a principled civil disobedience and insurgent protest plea. We should start with the realization that these struggles are usually started by ordinary people who create the possibilities for igniting another period of progressive legislation and spiritual creativity within the traditions of protest and countercultural activities. If there's any justification for a belief in American exceptionalism, that unique message that supposedly explains what America is all about, and what makes us different and proud, it is rooted 
in the American Revolution, the abolitionist movement, the labor movement, the Vietnam anti-war movement, the suffragette movement, the welfare rights movement, the civil rights movement, the Attica Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, Occupy Wall Street, and countless other attempts by ordinary Americans who collectively rose up in anger and hoped to defy dominant authorities by speaking truth to power and creating alternative political and economic structures. Our guests tonight have both stood in the forefront of this struggle in their respective fields, and we see how these fields are inextricably linked. Jim Gilligan listened carefully to what ordinary mental patients were telling him about their feelings and pain of humiliation, shame and disrespect, and what these feelings could lead to in destructive and self-destructive behavior. Jerry Lefcourt put his career and physical safety on the line numerous times in order to argue and take unpopular stands for often very unpopular and despised clients. We all know progressive gains need to be constantly defended. The state of law, liberty and psychiatry in America is in a much better place today as a result of their efforts and continuing efforts to bring a radical imagination into concrete forms of policy and legislation. I want to thank them both so much for being guests tonight, Jerry Lefcourt and Jim Gilligan, for the love, intelligence, and courage they've manifested in their lives and brought into the movement struggle. Thank you all for joining us on MNN, and see you next week when we will have the director of the new Black Panther movie, Stanley Nelson, on, along with community activist and New York City media icon, Felipe Luciano. This is Jim Vretos. Have a great week, and see you next week on The Radical Imagination. <laughs>